and growth uh, and the big changing world of how do you cope. Um, the uh, announcer did most of my work because she read the uh, description of the session and she also read the uh, uh, introduced uh, the panelists. So I think that we can, we're ready to go. I, I think one of the things I just would remind all of you and remind, I will remind myself and remind my panelists that we're actually having the China meeting in Vietnam. So this is the a China meeting. But we, of course, uh, we'll talk about Vietnam and other issues, but we're, we're going to discuss China. So in fact, with that, I'm going to start with uh, Dwayne and talk about the situation in China and your perspective as um, I mean, this was investments mainly in China, in country investments. Now, where do you see China now? You know, there's so much coverage, particularly in the Western media, that's kind of negative about the economy, uh, that even to the point of China has been. Uh, so, t tell us, what is your perspective on China and its continuing dynamism? All right, thank you. Uh, so, good afternoon. Uh, Again, my name is Nguyen Phuong. I, uh, I, before I get into that, just a couple of words on, on Xi Ming, the farm, so, so that you have the context of what, what we do and what kind of companies we, uh, we deal with. Uh, Xi Ming is a venture capital company, uh, primarily investing in China. Uh, we were probably one of the more prominent or, or, or bigger, whatever time you, you, you like to use it, uh, or more active. Firms in China. Uh, the firm is set up in 2006. So, in a way, to uh, uh, to, to ask uh, the question, the what what we have seen in terms of startup environments and uh, uh, the operating environments, the families, and so on and so forth, you know, have, have gone through a couple of cycles. And uh, we currently met our managing approximately 10 billion. U.S. dollars of uh, AUM, and uh, we, since we invest fairly early in two primary, primary sectors, a technology sector and a healthcare sector, uh, since we invest early, so we've done quite a number of deals since the beginning. Uh, we have a total, we would make a, a invested around 500 plus companies over the last uh, couple of decades. And uh, and I would say in today's environment, we we do see new and different challenges that we have not seen in the past. Uh, but if we run our, our our business and our daily life uh, just simply by looking at. Uh, and, uh, TV says, I don't want to name it. I was going to say which TV station that we can do. Uh, which publication? Or which publication, right? Uh, then then you, know, you, you can't say, uh, nothing gets done. Nice. So, so, so I guess my message is it's a glass half empty, half full. And in terms of the opportunity set and the dynamism, there are a few points I want to make. First of all, the Chinese entrepreneurial and innovative spirit is as high as ever. Despite all the, the, uh, the, the, the headline uh, in international coverage and so on, uh, when, we, when I started making investments in China, uh, there are a few things that, that we didn't see back then, which we saw in plentiful today. A, entrepreneurs that are seasoned and experienced founders. Uh, in the early days, founders tend to be uh, a, a, an inspirational, uh, 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 maybe visionary founder who couldn't hold a job in his prior company, and therefore he's founding a new company. But these days, we do have Founders who have gone through many different stages of career life, very seasoned, very experienced. Not only that, we also have seasoned executives who are able to come in and help manage these companies. So, on, on the uh, entrepreneurial side, and then on the innovation side, 
Uh, we invest a lot in AI, uh, just as uh, the other parts of, of, of uh, the developed world. We invest a lot in AI. We invest quite a bit in the automotive space, like uh, 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 autonomous driving, and EVs, and many of the sensors that go into these gadgets. And, and so on. So, so, so we can start to get into more of it. Can I just ask you uh, quickly if um, uh, two things that many people who are concerned about what's going on in the Chinese economy with Burma is one is the property subsidy and the other is debt. Uh, I'm wondering if very, very briefly you could, could deal with those two issues as current challenges from your perspective. Great question. Uh, the, the, the property, the real estate sector is in a major, a, in a substantial pullback, for sure. And real estate did represent a fairly sizable chunk of the Chinese GDP. So, so when, when that's, uh, in, in, in real estate, I, I live in Shanghai, my, uh, I, 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 I think my return from being a venture capitalist is, is quite good. But the house I bought, that return is even better. So, 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 so real estate prices have been gone through the roof over the last 10, 15 years. So that can no longer sustain itself. And uh, uh, however, I think the, the, the saving grace in this whole uh, uh, real estate correction is that the individual homeowner leverage is quite safe because of the high uh, upfront payment demand by commercial banks. So when I was talking to central bank uh, officials and, and governors in, in China, the message is it's extremely unlikely that the real estate crisis will become a banking crisis with the you know, effects soon to come. So that's the, so real estate down challenging, but it, it, it's never going to go back to the same part. And then, but but not not going to be on the debt side. The local government uh, uh, financing vehicle uh, has taken out fairly substantial debts over the last few years, uh, the last say decades. And but a lot of the so most of the local government vehicle debts went into infrastructure projects. And uh, if we part partition those infrastructure projects into Coastal provinces projects and hinterland projects, then the hinterland projects might be challenged. But the bulk of the coastal provinces and so on uh, were more likely to have somewhat of a cash flow issue rather than a quality of asset issue. So, uh, uh, so again, from, from PDLC's point of view, hearing it indirectly, uh, they do not believe uh, the central government lacks the ability to service these local debts. It is more of a willingness because of uh, 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 more, uh, more, uh, 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 so that local governments would have to first come up with their own way of servicing the local debts, but then uh, after all, so one of the things that I think this brings out is that uh, with China, uh, I think one of, I guess the model that one must think about is I guess there's political centralization, but in many ways in the economic sphere, there's a, a lot of decentralization. More decentralization. Right. And the provinces and municipalities and have, have a lot of uh, autonomy in the way to see. Uh, their policies and the economic sphere, and that often runs some of them. Uh, uh, sure, so, um, for an, another perspective on China and the dynamism, let's turn to Yang Chou Dan Su Zhe. You've been here with Hai Er, and I, you, know, um, you can introduce Hai Er to, to, to the audience, but I suppose I, I, I've known Hai Er as like, you know, my washing machine and everything. And, you know, all, all these things are, 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 are well known. Um, but you've been here 
Okay, so let me introduce myself. Uh, I'm living here three years or seven years. And uh, my first company is high growth. I think my classes come from uh, India or many global worlds. We use a different brand in different uh, region. So here we use other brand. Why come here? Because our uh, high growth wants to stay in, stay in Vietnam. Okay, our target, our uh, purpose to stay in your land uh, by the uh, province, and so we want to do it to visit number one for the global assistance. Uh, your land is a stretch market for high growth. This means we have, uh, have the zero one uh, population, so we need uh, to focus on the opportunity to stay in, get in, stay in, and uh, live up. This means we will be up to the best for the Vietnam consumer exception, consumer requirement. So we do the business for the washing machine, uh, refrigerator, air conditioner. Now, performance, performance in Vietnam, uh, washing machine already reach number one, 21% market share. And the uh, refrigerators, 18% uh, number top two for market share. Uh, we are very proud to share here. Uh, this is why uh, I'm still here. Thank you so much. So, um, when we were talking earlier, you mentioned that the products that hire makes here, 70% of it is for the Vietnam market, and 30% for outside of Vietnam in the region. Another, we build the supply too. Okay, so for brand, uh, for our company, we will build supply chain in localization. So we build the supply chain here, we focus on the Asian countries, not only for domestic market. So we do the, in, in this section, this uh, uh, factory, we not focus on the market, we focus on the Asian countries and the domestic market. This means the regional supply chain. You mentioned Indonesia and Thailand as a key Yes, in Indonesia and Thailand, we also have the industrial power. Manufacture the laboratory, washing machine, or today, or air conditioner, but we suffer a different segment, different factors. For example, the winters, we produce the double all here, and the side by side, and photo we make in China. These are seen by the category because. So, I'm wondering if, just uh, before we uh, move on to Johan, if you could talk a little bit about, uh, because the impression many people might have um, is that um, high earners come here in order to take advantage of, this is a different market, not subject to the tariffs on China goods, and that therefore you can then attack the, you can, you can approach the US market or Western market, but you don't. And, and indeed, um, as you were explaining, and maybe it's useful for the audience to understand, that higher product uh, appliances in the US are generally under the GE brand. So, 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 so they come across me more as a French or... Let me introduce the uh, airport for strategy in the US. We also use the much here about uh, 20%. We use a GE brand, GE appliances. So we we M and A, but we do the uh, cooperation with the GE in the GE brand, but for the GE brand, this means we keep the market of the of the black market, the operation uh, in uh, by law person in America. What where where the products come from for the American very professional life? The more globally the supply most come from Singapore, from Mexico and the USA. We have uh, 
three uh, manufacturing base in Mexico. We have five manufacturing base in America. So this is why we call the localized issues the regional uh, strategy. But you know why we do this? Because of the uh, consumer climate, different country, different region, different environment. For example, America, it looks like a big Africa, more than 400 meters. But in Vietnam, normally it would be like uh, 300 meters. In America and China, we, we, we focus on the 400 and 500 meters. The different style, also, the, the capacity, even the style difference. In China, we use a bottom mount. As America, we use a side by side. But in Vietnam, we use a top mount. It's very interesting. The product range is different. So this is why we do the different reading of at the localization zone. So in a, in, a, in a part sort of way, you actually have a strategy that is resilient to the geopolitical winds. In other words, we're now seeing all the geopolitical factors. But Hayar implemented this kind of regional strategy uh, in a, well, well in advance, and, 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 and therefore it must be uh, to your advantage. You know? You mean the, the well, well, the, the regional strategy, in fact, that you are... For example, Vietnam, yeah. we use a program, and also the farm uh, freeway, farm products freeway, and uh, uh, in Europe, we do the candy and hair. In Pakistan and in Indonesia, uh, India, we use a hair brand. So the brand is ready for the first The first question, uh, the first item. Second, the brand uh, position is Okay, so in uh, GE, normally we use uh, uh, middle, middle, middle brand, uh, Alpha we use middle to high brand, China, even China we use the new brand. China we have a Kasadi, we have we have a Hair, we have a Lena, many brand to separate the different requirement of segment, the constant group. Interesting strategy. Now, Johan, if I might. Um, if you could talk a bit about the environment now in Vietnam, the business environment, business climate, uh, particularly in the context of the China-Vietnam relationship. And of course, this has been driven in recent years because of the geopolitics, but I think it predates that. Really. Yeah, so talk a bit about the, 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 yeah, the I, 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 I don't think it's driven by geopolitics so much. Of course, that's. Uh, has been one of the factors lately, but uh, we can cite so many examples of corporate from China investing earlier in India. One of them. Um, but I think uh, the Chinese companies come to the self shop is a natural course of growth uh, um, from, from their own perspective, from their, from their own strategies. And they are just a couple of steps behind. Um, the Koreans and the Japanese who have done it uh, maybe 20, 30 years earlier. Uh, I think it's all natural because if you look at the uh, the growth and the development of the brands, the global brands, you can see that the Americans and the Europeans come first, and they uh, have uh, gradually evolved into setting up a manufacturing bases and diversifying their supply chains overseas, out, outside of their own home country. Uh, for example, the US was in South America, or Mexico, or matter, and uh, the Koreans, uh, actually, to begin with, I think maybe the Japanese went to Korea, and both the Japanese and the Koreans went to China, and then to Vietnam, so it's a, just a natural course of uh, corporate uh, growth rather than, uh, rather than geopolitics, I would imagine. Uh, but it's driven by the, I, in my view, uh, I think it's driven by the globalization of the consumer brand. And if they you are talking about manufacturing of consumer products, yeah. electronics uh, are a big chunk of it. So we have seen, uh, as I mentioned, the, 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 the biggest uh, product with the biggest uh, manufacturing uh, base uh, of a global consumer brand is Samsung. We have set up shop quite a few years ago, and now uh, we are the, the biggest investor in Vietnam. 
that respect. Uh, and so I think the next phase, I think we have seen some Thai and uh, maybe Malaysia, originally speaking, have set up uh, uh, manufacturing bases in Vietnam, but because they don't own global brands, uh, I think we have seen uh, somewhat of a limited uh, uh, existence from those uh, brands and from those uh, companies in Vietnam. I think the biggest uh, up and coming uh, global brands have to be from China. We have seen uh, BYD, for example. And so recently we have uh, seen Cherry, uh, probably the second biggest uh, electric um, uh, car manufacturer from China who have uh, uh, signed and looked up to put money to Vietnam in the billions of dollars. So I think that's the first phase. And of course, uh, Cherry is not going to make cars only for the Vietnam market because the Vietnam market's uh, automobile um, market is still uh, very limited. So I think uh, Cherry can set up uh, a manufacturing base in Vietnam to make cars for, 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 for the region uh, outside of China, I would imagine, in a similar way as Highway has done for, for their products in the past, uh, and then maybe in the future sell me to come. Uh, and I think those are the next step in, in the development of, uh, of the, uh, the, the strategy of uh, globalization, of globalizing the uh, uh, manufacturing uh, of uh, products from the global brands. So what are we seeing, uh, in, given the more recent uh, geopolitical challenges, are we seeing Chinese companies using them Issues related to uh, if you're exporting directly from China, uh, the Chinese companies have not done it uh, themselves directly. For example, in the case of Foxconn, uh, who is a uh, sort of like a global uh, Foxconn of India, uh, well, Foxconn of Taiwan, Foxconn of China, Foxconn of wherever, right? Uh, they have set up uh, manufacturing. Uh, facilities in Vietnam, but they would have to bring with them the suppliers of the part. And so I think that's the, 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 the uh, whether you call it China or whether you call it uh, geopolitics, I think the next uh, step in, in the development of uh, globalization is just outsourcing the uh, manufacturing basis of when I was here for the uh, Horasis uh, Asian Asian, I held up um, my two iPhones. One was uh, um, assembled in China, the other one was assembled in India, and both of them both the same models. Yeah, could you see an iPhone uh, assembled in India? Yeah, yeah, definitely, of course. Of course, I think, uh, Very soon. I think uh, Apple will, uh, has probably put in, in the plan by starting to make uh, certain components or certain products. Uh, like, uh, I think uh, Apple has already started making AirPods in Vietnam uh, for headsets or whatever. Um, and I think that it's natural that the next step would be for Foxconn to start uh, assembling the iPhone to the iPad or whatever. Now, before I go to Rana, uh, one question. Uh, you mentioned EVs. Uh, now, Vietnam has its own EV uh, companies. So, are we seeing the entry of Chinese aspirants creating a very competitive environment in those in that kind of um, niche for them, in that kind of uh, uh, industry? Yeah, I think if you uh, look at Vietnam's economy, and of course, Vietnam's economy is still small. Right? Say uh, that of China or that of uh, Japan, Korea. So Vietnam is going to be used more as a manufacturing base rather than a uh, uh, consumer market. For sure, uh, Vietnam's consumer market is growing, 
Right, as I mentioned before, I don't think Jerry is going to take all the cars in Vietnam to sell to the Vietnamese uh, consumers. And the same would, uh, in fact, in fact, it's not going to put cars in Vietnam just to uh, sell to the Vietnamese consumers. As a matter of fact, we work with a company called Paco, which is the biggest uh, car assembler in Vietnam. They make uh, a lot of Mazda and Kia, uh, not only for the Vietnam market, but they also have to export quite a bit. Uh, as long as those uh, in the distribution network, they have to balance it out with auto manufacturing bases in the region, in Thailand and Indonesia. So I think, uh, so uh, as I mentioned in Vietnam, there is a, a budding, a growing middle class consumer market, but I don't think it's what people are, are going after. Yes, it will be competitive nonetheless. Uh, and yes, the Vietnamese companies are growing their own uh, brands, including uh, GitFast, for example, uh, to try to uh, capture the uh, local market. Uh, but I think it's fair enough for, for a lot of uh, uh, consumer products in Vietnam. And, and uh, soon enough, you will have uh, Vietnamese brands competing with the high oil, for example. Uh, and high is now competing with Toshiba, for example. So I think the market is going to grow and, and be able to accommodate a lot of different brands, but I think it's just a natural uh, involvement, uh, evolution of, uh, of the, 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 the brand uh, and the affinity towards the Chinese market. So we could see kind of a new wave of Vietnam. Yeah, well, well, Bill France, for example, has already uh, started to export their cars to different countries. Uh, I think we had to uh, take that with a, a little bit of a uh, grain of salt, uh, so to speak, but I think uh, there is a uh, natural cause of uh, involvement and evolution for the product. Great, thank you very much. Now, Nora, uh, if I could tap your knowledge uh, from your part of the world, um, you're making the casting great again. And, um, so, so tell us a little bit about um, the AI outreach, uh, particularly, I mean, we don't know if I'm going to be on the other side, but, um, you know, China is kind of recasting the Belt and Road Initiative, and that kind of is important for this part of the world, not in this part of the world, but certainly from uh, the part of the world where you're from. Certainly. Uh, first of all, ladies and gentlemen, to the delegates, uh, I would like uh, to say uh, that we are very grateful to Dr. Frank Richter bringing us here together. I'm third time in this uh, Bindong province, in this nice place. And uh, each time I'm coming, uh, a different meeting, now it's uh, for us as China meeting, and I'm uh, getting new friends, uh, like uh, members of our big for us as family, and thank you for this. And also thank you for the Bindong province management for that hospitality. Thank you. Great. Especially just to this concept was uh, exceptional. And uh, now back to the question. Yes, you are right. Belt uh, and Road Initiative was extremely important uh, for the Greater Caspian region. And uh, just to remind the Greater Caspian region, it's a uh, 15 countries uh, from east side and west side of the Caspian Sea, including Central Asia, Afghanistan and Pakistan, Caucasus, and uh, the Black Sea countries, starting between Turkey and Kazakhstan. Uh, and what we see, uh, China has a significant influence in the region. And uh, we saw this. Uh, we were very interested in before the COVID pandemic started. Uh, there were a lot of projects that China helped uh, to implement and finance and invest. Uh, even I was the part of the Swiss delegation uh, when we signed the memorandum for, for, for strategic cooperation for building an initiative for the, for the third markets. Like uh, Switzerland was supposed to be kind of the bridge between China and the building of markets. Uh, unfortunately, the COVID pandemic started, everything was disrupted. Uh, China was uh, closed down for several years. And then uh, I, we got the news that according to the new five years plan, I think it was 2021, uh, China will concentrate on domestic circulation and uh, they will slow down the projects. Uh, for us, it was a little bit short because uh, there were really a lot of thoughts. Luckily, now China is open again, and uh, we saw already that uh, the new declaration from China that now they would like to revitalize the new projects. And uh, this is a great support uh, for the Caspian region, because uh, our region is the part of the ancient Silk Road between Europe and China. And uh, 
Hotel was even uh, invented, but geographically the shortest way between China and Europe going through the Caspian region, and uh, this was more than 2,000 years. Uh, that's why we see the great potential, and uh, now I will a little bit go into details for a couple of minutes uh, just uh, to explain what is already existing. And uh, China uh, is, a, I think, the biggest investor to Kazakhstan today uh, for a lot of projects. Uh, and uh, China uh, developing uh, several mega projects in Turkmenistan, mainly related to natural gas production, foraging and production. And uh, Turkmenistan, uh, before the Russian war started, was the biggest supplier of natural gas to China. And uh, uh, China was the big, big, biggest market for Turkmenistan. It was a mutual judicial cooperation on a really large scale. I will tell you the numbers about 35 to 38 billion cubic meters. Meters, no, it's the run it was supplied by the pipeline. And I just uh, told to, uh, my colleagues, my friends, that uh, uh, Chinese companies managed to build 7,000 kilometer gas pipeline in 18 months. And nobody believed that this would be in the possible, but this was done. And uh, now we are going a little bit west, we have Georgia. Uh, Georgia is a unique country which has a free trade agreement with China and with the European Union. That's why Georgia could be the hub for the Chinese uh, uh, goods for fulfilled processing in Georgia and then supplying to the Union and vice versa. And also other countries are very much uh, involved and doing business with China. I can talk about Kyrgyzstan, Pakistan, Tajikistan. Uh, China is very active in, even in Afghanistan. Uh, recently I did a news that the new tunnel, tunnel was uh, built through the mountains to connect uh, Afghanistan with China, but I think this is a great, uh, great initiative also, and also Pakistan and so on. That's why uh, we are really, uh, we see that uh, there is a big potential, there is a big goal for the cooperation between the Great Caspian region and China. Uh, you, uh, the, the Belt and Road Initiative um, was launched just over 10 years ago, and we're supposed to be in a kind of Belt and Road 2.0, where there's been a readjustment, not just of um, you know, oversight and issues like that, because of course there was a lot of criticism about that that diplomacy and such, but also in terms of the size of, uh, of some of these projects, as well as the approach that China was taking. Previously they were taking a kind of big, uh, China kind of approach, and it was becoming a little bit more Modest, that uh, from your perspective, given that you are really looking at the region that you uh, look at, is looking at the forefront of that Belt and Road Initiative footprint, or your being running right that footprint. Uh, how do you see the Belt and Road Initiative changing, um, in, particularly also in terms of the impact? You know, what has been the impact so far? And how is it being, how is China adjusting the BI from your perspective to make it perhaps more effective? Uh, first of all, I would like to remind you that uh, 11 years ago, Belt and Road Initiative was born in Kazakhstan. When uh, Chairman Xi came to Kazakhstan with his great speech in the university and announced the Belt and Road Initiative. This was the beginning. Uh, now, yes, at the beginning, uh, the approach was a bit aggressive, uh, but uh, for our region, maybe it was not uh, so aggressive like it was in other parts of like Africa and so on. That's why uh, uh, at the end some projects started to move. Uh, and uh, also I would like uh, to tell you a bit of the history that uh, historically uh, our region was mainly the part of the Soviet Union. And in the Soviet Union, uh, was, uh, let's say, empire style of doing things. Like in Moscow, there was a decision to build 5,000 kilometer railway. And then the whole Soviet Union was concentrated on the railway. For example, uh, you know there is the biggest in the world channel, Karakun uh, channel in Afghanistan. Uh, in Moscow, they decided to dig this channel, more than 1,000 kilometers from the Amadaria River, in order to bring water to the desert regions of Afghanistan in order to increase production of food. And this was done in just a few years. The whole Soviet Union was working there. 
and uh, when the Soviet Union collapsed, uh, resources of each uh, particular country uh, became not enough to build the mega projects. That's why uh, all we were needed uh, to consolidate resources of all the region to do something big. Or we need the partner, the big partner who can afford to invest thousands of billions of dollars and uh, uh, to perform such projects. And China today, I think, uh, this is the most logical partner for it. First of all, geographically, it's quite close because uh, the United States is far away. Europe, sorry to say, is big, big now, fragmented. And uh, uh, Russia is the other stuff, the politics. And uh, China could uh, uh, cover this gap, like uh, after the Soviet Union disappeared, and uh, do the big projects with the help of the, of course, of the countries of the region, with the help of the local partners, uh, local companies, and local people. And uh, here uh, I'm not uh, afraid that uh, it will be a dead trap or so on, because uh, uh, first of all, and this was potentially the role of Switzerland uh, suggested in 2019, that uh, Switzerland could come kind of intermediary for such projects and uh, uh, bringing Chinese investment channel into Switzerland with the Swiss business ethics, uh, Swiss business mentality for the region. But we'll see what will happen, uh, but uh, I'm not afraid the uh, important is to do the good things. And uh, how to structure this, this is secondary. Great, thank you very much. Now we're going to shift from having talked about China's economic conditions, the challenges China's facing, then we talked about uh, China's relationship with Vietnam region and with uh, the um, greater uh, Caspian region. We're going to shift because you know, business dynamism also depends a lot on what companies themselves are doing in terms of strategy. And so it is a then, if I might. Um, can you talk a bit about the challenge of technology and how, what, what what challenges do businesses face in adopting, adapting to the fourth industrial revolution age, adopting technology in order to ensure that they can continue to buy money? First of all, thank you so much for our friend uh, for inviting me here, and I'm so honored to be the only lady amongst very accomplished gentlemen, so thank you. Um, on the topic of um, technology, I think uh, nowadays you know, we're, we're facing both the critical challenges globally. Uh, we talked about you know, geopolitics, uh, climate, we mentioned yesterday, ESG, and so on. Um, these are all challenges that not only businesses face, but people face. Um, but at the same time, if we take another spin and we look, in Chinese, hui ji, hui is also ji hui, right? So crisis is also opportunity. So how do we turn this critical juncture in history and turn that into the greatest opportunity, especially now that technology is developing so quickly? expanding and developing at an exponential level. As we all know, generative AI with ChatGPT and many others coming up, that's only one type of technology. There are many others. In fact, the World Economic Forum, uh, of which I'm part of, the Global Shasha, they also have uh, a report on the top 10 uh, emerging technologies that are likely to be disrupting our world. For better or worse, it really is technology as a tool, like fire, like electricity, right, that people can use to do good or to do harm. So in a practice of mindfulness and mindful leadership, it's all about how do we first frame the challenge as an opportunity, and then how do we then use these technology as enabler and as tools to solve important challenges for this generation and the coming generation, and for us to be better ancestors. So, um, you know some examples of uh, technologies that are coming up? Uh, Gen and I, of course. The second is also flexible battery. So in the future, batteries will make, flexible batteries will make our screens rollable, but also embed them into our clothes, for example. And that has immense uh, potential also in healthcare. 
uh, how we can then monitor all our biosensors and so on. Um, designer phages, uh, these are engineering viruses that can be used to augment human, plant, and animal health. Right? There, there's also metaverse coming up that's for mental health and reproductive and many others. But I've also worked in uh, Monitor Deloitte as a chief of staff and a consultant. Um, and oftentimes businesses are trying to do digital transformation. They look for consulting firms. But actually, when we through all these cases, the most challenging part for any business to do this type of technological transformation, digital transformation, is actually not really the technology itself, but rather it's the people. Because it's the people who are going to be using it, are going to be designing it. Are they willing to change the way of work? Are they willing to change their business model to adapt to these new technologies? And that's the biggest part, which is also why now in the uh, Unicorns for Good, we're also especially working on mindful leadership. So how do we bring the top leaders in an organization to adopt this mindful mentality that is not ingrained and fixed, but actually is open, non-biased, non-judgmental, and embracing of opportunities and challenges, and using technology as a force for good to create returns for people, planet, and problem. Interesting. Now, I'm, I will inform that when we had our discussion breakout group uh, just a couple of hours ago on discussing STEM education is it necessary growth. You were there. And so I, I, I have to then ask, right? Uh, what is your perspective in terms of, because you brought up the issue of it's a people issue, people challenge to a large extent. What, what are we doing right and wrong in terms of, I mean, is STEM education so necessary, or do we need to be more open-minded about uh, the kind of education we do in order that businesses can, can be dynamic and can approach technology in a way that ensures that they'll continue to grow? Many countries are focusing on STEM education. Um, and right now what we see is very deep expertise. We're going very deep in a, in a specific, specific vertical. But actually what is also needed is also thinking about the purpose. Because um, in the past two years, I've actually toured around the world and uh, visited over a hundred uh, most innovative organizations from the whole lab to market value chain of technology. So from universities to research labs to science parks, tech for good companies, investors, family offices, and so on. What I find most precious is actually some of these organizations that at the core they have purpose that they want to use technology to solve a real important challenge that we're facing, whether it's people or it's that. So I, I think for one part is the very technical expertise that we're developing through STEM education is great. But what I think will be really important in this era is the bridge of application, a technology application that's not just making things cheaper, better, faster, higher quality, but actually, can this actually improve someone's life? Can this actually make this planet more livable and sustainable in the future? So that is a key question. How do we embed this mindfulness in all the engineers, in all the technologists, and in all the leaders that are in such power to create very powerful technology? And do you see that happening in China, in this part of the world, in the ASEAN in the region? Are there enough uh, businesses take that kind of approach? It's, uh, I think there's a wave of consciousness that's coming. I think the, you know, the Scandinavian countries, for example, Sweden, Finland, and so on, they are very much high up in the purpose. So, in fact, a lot of the organizations that we visited, they said, if what we're doing is not for purpose and not for impact, then why do we do it? But I think this mentality yet has to be come to this region, although I do also see 
very passionate entrepreneurs using tech for good. For example, an Asian entrepreneur who is using technology to skip carbon dioxide into carbon and into water. And the carbon will then be used as fertilizer for the soil. So that can also be used in very dry areas to help with food security, because water will be an issue, fresh water will be an issue. So things like this, we do see it's coming, but I think we need a collective push to remind why we do things in those places. So kind of need for innovation and creativity, but innovation is because we have to put in these creative ideas to the market. It's kind of important. So we're going to go to King Raja. And King Raja, um, uh, Dwayne already brought up the fact that many of the businesses um, that uh, we're talking about here in this part of the world in China, a lot of them are you know, I actually would like to reintroduce you uh, that you are adjunct professor, senior advisor, and founding director of the Roger King Center for Asian Family Business and Family Office at Hong Kong University of Science and Technology. And you're senior advisor and founding director of the Thompson Center for Business and Studies, also at Hong Kong University. So from that perch, in the ivory tower, uh, King Roger. Can you tell us how are these kinds of companies, these family companies, trying to remain dynamic despite all the changes that we talked about? And they're kind of seen as things, they're old style, but they've got to change. And how is that happening? Is it happening? Well, thank you. Not by itself. Oh, okay. Yeah, I think uh, you, you know the issue of family business itself is very, very important. In fact, you may or may not be aware of it. Most economies, uh, the largest portion of businesses is actually family owned. If you take a country like Germany, two thirds of the uh, contribution, the GDP contribution, are uh, from family to family businesses itself. Okay? So this is why we focus on, um, I want to take a look at that to the structure of the business itself. And uh, so we're living in a very, very different world today, you know, changing the world, part of the itself. And there are two obvious changes. Number one is that we're all living longer, right? Lifespan, I mean, many of you in this room probably have relatives or friends whatever, that's close to 100 or even you know, more than 100 years old. So lifespan, human lifespan is increasing all the time. But the problem is, as mentioned by you, the business life cycle is getting shorter and shorter and shorter. Okay? And the question is that, are people adjusted well enough to change their business model? Now, we focus a little bit more on China, but this is actually true for most of China, anyway. In China, you're really talking about from first to second generation family business itself. So many of the founders are still around. And, uh, you know, they are in businesses that are very, very traditional. They don't really know how to change, uh, you know, based on technology and this and that and so forth. This is one of the biggest problems one has. And the way they run the business, you know, they, they, they control everything, they don't trust outsiders, uh, they want to make all the decisions. And okay? this is probably true in Vietnam as well, I just guess it. Okay? Guess what? The next generation of these very successful businesses, uh, they send their children to overseas to study. When they come back, guess what? 80 plus percent do not want to join the bank business. Then the question is, what happens then? You know, for Asians, passing the business on to the next generation is very, very important. You know, this is part of our culture itself. But if the next generation is not willing to take the business, right? why? They want to do their own thing. They, they're more, much more interested in technology-oriented businesses rather than manufacturing. Okay? So this is one of the biggest challenges uh, these days. You know, the idea of next-gen uh, taking over the business itself. Uh, 
Uh, and, you know, according to the, uh, at Johnson University did a study seven years back, it actually showed 80 plus percent of the next gen. But what happens to the family business? Do they sell it? Give it away? Or hire professional people? Well, to most first generation, none of those are actually acceptable alternative. Okay? This is very, very challenging. So, uh, Al, you mentioned that I've been involved with university for quite some time and teaching and research and so forth. One of the classes I teach is how does one sell a family business? Okay? When the founder is there, it's a bit emotional for them to sell a business. So it's not to sell a family. How about hiring professional management or the family? That they don't like to also. Why? Because a lot of those relationships businesses, this part of the world, call social capital. And if you hire someone that's very, very intelligent, smart, they work for you, pretty soon they know everything about your business, they become your competitor. Okay? So this is another topic. So what is going to be about the business? This is one of the uh, key challenges. Okay? One thing that was uh, raised earlier was, uh, you know, you talk about the Chinese investing in possible. Uh, incidentally, you know, the Chinese, overseas Chinese are very, very successful, especially in Southeast Asia. You know, you take a country like, uh, I don't know if it's true necessary in Vietnam, but uh, uh, Thailand, uh, Indonesia, Philippines, you take the 10 top richest persons in those countries, I guarantee you half of them are ethnic. Okay? So the question is that, how do they pass this wealth on to future generations? So we're facing a different kind of challenge because business life cycle is getting so short that because of technology, talk about AI, talk about the internet of things, it's living through uh, Western Revolution 4.0 and stuff. You know? I mean, some of you don't remember, you know, these uh, so-called smartphones, when I was first using these smartphones, it's the size of a brick, so big. Today, there's more computing power in your, your, your smartphone than, uh, you know, uh, let's say 20 years, 30 years ago, the largest computer never had it. So we're facing a different kind of challenge, especially if you introduce the element of family, family. Now, um, many people would then say, you shift from a family that knows how to do business, it's always one to professional managers and the dynamism is gone, uh, you know, the mojo is gone. Uh, is, does, this, does no research bear out that kind of narrative? Well, this is it. You know, the uh, question is that, uh, you know, the idea of switching from manager and ownership to pure manager, uh, sorry, uh, pure owner, okay, that's also very, very challenging. So the question is that, you know, you may start a business company, you have a company, but you still control the ownership of the itself. The question is that, because our culture is that next generation is very, very important, our goal is to ensure that they have a good or better life than us. So the question is that they don't want to join the family business. Why are we passing off? So this is something that, Okay, now I'm mindful that we have about five minutes left, and I might go like a couple of minutes over because I'm going to institute a kind of lightning round where I'm going to uh, go through the panel again in the same order, but I'm going to ask you to really keep your uh, reply brief. Uh, sure. So, for you, Dwayne, you have talked about the Chinese, economic Chinese, the business Chinese. Um, and we, I think most people will agree, whatever you know, spin or whatever, that, that, that China is having a, a serious economic challenges and uh, structural uh, challenges. Um, what's, your, uh, what's the outcome? Uh, when will China get out of the woods and what, what should we look for? I mean, very briefly, I'm sorry, but. Uh, so, I think China will eventually get out of the woods. And uh, while certain segments of the economy will be challenging, 
uh, there's there are also new segments of econ that's bringing a lot of dynamisms and a lot of uh, new creativity. So I think the, the, the new part of it will bring the entrenched system part of China along. And is that new part private or will we see it in the states? I, I think it would have to be quite a bunch of times that that would have to be managed and so on. Now, I'm going to go to uh, Sutur. Sutur. Brand management, this seems to be like China's uh, superpower in a way. And that you've actually been um, patient in uh, developing that kind of brand strategy in order to avoid some of the geopoliticals. So going forward, do you uh, foresee uh, what, what is the outlook for a Thai power uh, in Vietnam? Where are you heading? Uh, in, in particular, in an ASEAN context, is that how it is? Very quickly. So, I think the company being the focus on the brand image. Second, really the focus on the uh, product. How to reach the department, the customer company. Uh, it is a high technology. And then, I need to really uh, build, to rebuild supply chain, globalization, and globalization. They also have this technology about uh, digitalization and uh, AI technology, even uh, this is a uh, global. What is the business in the TV? Uh, what the TV? What's the What's the customer? Where? So what's the customer? You find us. What's What's the customer? When? This means which market you focus on. Then they are great. So when you do the globalization and the localization. We need to find the more challenge for the business investment. We bring the value, we bring the added value to the local people. This means we bring the value to Vietnam. We bring the value to America. We bring further for the customer. We can adapt the supply chain more to efficiency. Use the high technology for products, for manufacturers. This is our thinking in global. Right now, um, Johan, Vietnam has been regaled to a large extent these days as the great balancer in the U.S. China competition. Uh, uh, Xi Jinping visited here uh, last year, and uh, Biden also visited. Um, going forward, uh, is Vietnam going to continue to be able to successfully uh, manage that kind of Balancing act of which is now recorded as a masterpiece. Yes, I think the oh, I think Vietnam can do it up uh, naturally. Yes, I think Vietnam can do it naturally, and I think uh, uh, the fits right in. Uh, not in, not only in terms of uh, geopolitics, uh, but also in terms of the globalization of France. As I mentioned earlier, I think they have gone through. Brand globalization 1.0, which was American brands and European brands. 2.0 was probably uh, regional brands like uh, Japanese and Koreans. Uh, 3.0 is already here, I think, with the Chinese brands uh, uh, expanding further, both in terms of capturing the, the, the Vietnamese consumer market, but also using Vietnam as a manufacturing place to expand to other countries. Uh, and who knows, maybe in the uh, not too distant future, there will be uh, a 4.0 version with uh, Vietnamese brands uh, competing with Chinese brands, but also expanding uh, in their own way to certain parts of the world, including being fast, including, uh, for example, FPT. So I mentioned FPT is a great name because nobody outside of Vietnam hears of it, but I was in Japan last month and I visited. Uh, they have an FTD uh, uh, shop, and they have 3,500 engineers based in Japan alone, just uh, rolling out products from Japanese and uh, North, North, North uh, Asian market. So I think the Vietnamese brands will have uh, a, uh, an opportunity to fit in what the globalization of the brands for Great. All the conflict in the world. Geopolitics, uh, that, you know, we've seen still have the same war, uh, Israel, Hamas, and you know, Iran's now coming to the picture. 
Uh, what is your sense uh, in terms of, I mean, because your part of the world tends to be more uh, affected by all of this, uh, uh, especially the Eurasia kind of connection. Um, do you, are you concerned at all? Where, where do you see it uh, uh, developing? Uh, of course, we are concerned uh, our region because we are right uh, in the middle between uh, two big complex, uh, uh, Russia and China, soon enough. In the south, we have uh, now Israel, Hamas, Iran, and so on. Uh, on top of that, uh, there was a conflict which was resolved uh, between Azerbaijan and Armenia, uh, right in the center of world. No, it's now resolved. It's now resolved just a of time when the peace agreement will be signed and the new borders will be. Uh, Fixed, uh, it's another, I think, maybe one year maximum, uh, in my view. Uh, and uh, for the region, is a big problem because uh, what we are facing now, uh, the region got a high risk pressure in the banks. Uh, very difficult now to get investments to the region. Uh, very difficult to get even financing, even for trade for the FDM. But then just see on the map. Okay, there is a huge war here, the problem here, we don't know whether we stay away, better we wait. Uh, it's a uh, really the disruption of the trade, of course, uh, and uh, we all hope that all these conflicts will be resolved as soon as possible. I hope so, maybe in the horizon of one year, all these three, uh, these two problems will be resolved. Uh, but uh, again, this is a major concern for the region. Great. There is a great time. ESG. Sometimes people, that nowadays people can talk about getting rid of it or ignoring it. Or do you see uh, ESG as continuing possibly uh, to gain, regain momentum, if you will, because there seems to be a kind of backlash against these things in parts of the Another, it is ESG education, and that's also why with giving more opportunities, we're working very hard at cultivating conscious leaders, both at the very top. Uh, business leaders level, C-suite founders, as well as the next gens that you've mentioned, and to the corporate um, teams and organizations, such that this becomes a, a movement that's not just about regulation, it's not just about KPI, but it's actually something that we each of us truly care about, and that we push this. It's a critical moment where we become the generation that creates a shift to <laughs> new civilization from industrial civilization to conscious civilization. Finally, King Roger, is the next generation capable? Um, we've talked a, a lot about how, you know, education, social media is deteriorating people's minds, creativity. And is the next generation even capable of being as creative and innovative as their uh, forefathers and for, well, for parents? Yeah. Yeah. You, you, you talk about capability, you know, it's that very, of course, capability is very, very important. But to me, to be successful in life, one has to be passionate, whatever that is. Okay? So the question is that we as parents or grandparents, you've got to make sure that future generation have a passion, whatever they do. That passion may be part of your business, may not be part of your business. The key is to make sure they have a passion somewhere. So for me, I always I have this uh, acronym when I call CCKP. Sorry, yeah. You have to have these four characteristics to succeed in life. The first C is, are you confident whatever you do? Second C is commitment. Are you committed? K is knowledge. You know what you're doing. Finally, P is passion. These are the four elements you must have. Otherwise, you can't succeed in them. Right. So I can guarantee you that off this panel, everybody has a certain passion. You've seen it, exhibited. And uh, the one person I know who's extremely passionate about everything that we're doing is Frank Jurgen Richard. And I just wanted to thank him very much and the Horizon Group for bringing us together and convening this session. I'm five minutes, six minutes over. I apologize for that. Uh, but thank you very much. Please thank the panel. Thank you.